Hi, everyone, and welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm Christy Stratus, author of the historical suspense series, The Dark Victoriana Collection, and my awesome co-host is Richard H. Stevens, epic fantasy author of the series Soulforge Universe, Soulforge Saga, and more. Lurking for Legends is a live interactive broadcast and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guests or simply make comments on what you hear in the show. So tonight we have O.E. Tierman, which is made up of Olivia Wiley and E.S. Argentum, LGBTQ plus sci-fi author of Aces High Joker's Wild series. So welcome to you both. We're so glad to have you. How are you tonight? Yes, welcome to Lurking for Legends. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, we are melting. <laughs> yes, we're rather warm. Um, I'm in somewhat better step shape. I just jumped out of a very cold shower, but it's supposed to be over here. So we're in Colorado. Oh boy, yeah, I know the heat has been really overwhelming, right? I, I totally understand, but I'm glad you guys could both make it. And why don't we just start with um, each of you could tell us a little bit about yourselves and about the series as well. Yeah, uh, do you want to go first, Liv, since you're the O? Sure, I'm the O in O.E. Tierman, and um, I am a small business owner. I'm a horticulturist by trade who owns a landscaping company. And a lot of my thoughts on climate change and horticulture and plants and agriculture end up in these books. And I love working on the possibilities, both the ones I'm afraid of and the ones I'm hopeful for, which goes a lot into this work. And I'm Ia Sargentum. Uh, in addition to writing as O.E. Tierman, I also have my own queer fantasy and sci-fi. Um, I'm hoping to have my first book out sometime this fall. I've got some short stories out now. Um, I am not very interesting, so I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, Everyone thinks they're not interesting. <laughs> talk about yourself. Um, so yeah, I have my own writing series. I do social media for a day job. So fun. Um, and the Aces High Jokers Wild series is a queer, hopeful cyberpunk, is, is how we're describing it, which is a lot of like oxymoronic words smashed together, but here we are. Yeah, and um, we, we definitely stress the punk element of it. It's a series of scrappy hopefulness. It's a series that says, okay, I see your broken world and I raise you the intent to make it better, no matter what. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah, I absolutely love that. So, you know, the series itself is um, dystopian, sci-fi, and it is diverse as well. Um, so what inspired you to write this series in the first place? Well, um, we had been writing together on another project before, for some time, um, we wrote on together on a steampunk webcomic, and that's where we learned to write together. And then 2016 hit, like a hammer. And we run in a lot of diverse groups and we're both LGBT, we're both under the rainbow somewhere. And so all of our friend groups were getting very depressed, very nihilistic. Everyone just kept repeating to each other, we're screwed, we're screwed, we're screwed. So originally um, we were riffing on a piece that ES was working on and they turned to me and said, I need some help with this. Can, do you want to bounce it around with me? And I turned to them after a little bit of work and said, hey, what if we took all of this we're screwed mindset and said, fine, let's pause it, we're screwed. Let's say, write the darkest version of America we could imagine and then write our way out of it and figure out how we get out of the darkest version as a way to tell ourselves and the rest of the world, okay, even if things go to hell in a handbasket, even if everything does not work out and we get a corporate dystopia that we have nightmares about, we will still take care of each other. We will still create families and we will still find our way out one day. Yeah, a lot of it was catharsis 
creatively for the both of us to work through our own feelings and our own fear. Mm -hmm. um, the diversity aspect was really important to us from the beginning uh, because as Liv said, we both run in really diverse circles. And for me, uh, I'm genderqueer. And so I wanted some sort of not cisgender representation that wasn't solely about you know transitioning or realizing your gender. And so being able to take that and put that into Aiden, one of the protagonists who is trans and is going through transition, um, it was just, it was a really good way for me to work through a lot of my own gender identity issues and to find my own kind of core and my roots. And I hope, I think both of us, um, I'm putting words in your mouth, Liv, I'm not sorry. Um, yeah. Both of us hope that that diversity, both the, the gender, the race, the language, all of the things that we could put in there can reach the right people and give them that hope and that sense of representation because we know it can be really, really hard to find sometimes. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And just uh, for the viewers that don't know, uh, Tierman is a, a term that uh, you guys use. And what is the significance of that term, Tierman? I'm just I'm thinking this might be tying into exactly what you're just talking about right now. Yeah. We both speak the Irish language. By and means roughly our learning. We're not fluent at all. <laughs> we both study the Irish language. I will rephrase that. Um, and chairman is the word for a sanctuary. It originally referred specifically to a port that was safe from storms or a harbor that was safe during the worst of the storms. But it became the term for any form of sanctuary. So on chairman became like, it became used for hospital, sometimes orphanage, any place where the weak are kept safe or those in need of healing are kept safe. And because we're writing about characters who are providing one another that place where they can be safe and grow into themselves, we decided to go with chairman and uh, anglicize it when we pronounce it to tierman because um, the Irish language does, doesn't have the sharp T sound. Weird. But the Irish language is weird. We borrowed it off the sheet. We borrowed it off the fairy folk and humans have never been sure how to use it since. <laughs> so um, if, for me, it's it's a connection back to my, my family lineage. Um, I'm mixed race, Irish on one side, Menominee on the other. And so for me, it's a nice way to nod to that but it was also a connection that we had, um, the two of us as friends and as writing buddies. So yeah, it was a nice word that meant everything we needed to, but if someone wasn't interested, they didn't need to go into it. Mm -hmm. No, that's awesome. It's a very powerful word actually, when you realize what the meaning is. Yeah. So yes, um, you mentioned that one of the things that you're doing as you're writing is sort of, you know, it's a catharsis, you're working things out for yourself, realizing things about yourself. And I think that so many writers can say that. Um, and since, you know, we're talking about diverse topics, do you find it like, um, I don't know if you read reviews at all. Do you, um, do you sort of, are you able to distance yourself from reviews? You guys have excellent reviews, by the way, anybody who's looking at their reviews, they have really good reviews. Um, but you know, sometimes when we're working things out for ourselves, when we're writing, um, it can be like when you read reviews, a little nerve wracking to see how people accept what is actually true for you. Um, and they don't even know that it's true for you. Um, do you feel that way as well? I mean, reviews in general are really nerve wracking because you're putting something out there that you've worked really, really hard on. And adding that personal catharsis and personal working through into it is just kind of another layer of nerve wracking. Um, I personally tend to avoid the reviews unless Olivia sends me a really, really nice one. That's usually what happens. Um, I'm the one who reads them obsessively and I send them to ES when they're good. <laughs> I, I keep trying to get her to stop obsessing over them, <laughs> but it, it's not working. Um, 
Sometimes it serves a purpose, though. Um, we had a writer milestone. We got our first piece of serious hate mail. So we copied and pasted it and turned it into the speech for one of the antagonists in the next book. Nice. Be warned, you the writers, you will be written into the book. <laughs> That's awesome. That was really great. <laughs> I love it. Not that we would do that with reviews, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that's about all you can do with those things. And even with negative reviews, like a lot of people, and myself included, my very first book, its very first review was a one-star review. And I found out this guy was a troll that did this to everybody other than Brandon Sanderson. Like he was just loved Brandon Sanderson, no one else was a writer. So he just trolled every fantasy writer, gave a one-star review and said oh, their stuff was awful. And then said by Brandon Sanderson. But I was devastated because it was my only review. Oh. And you know, so when people see my book, they don't know who Richard Stevens is. Oh, he's got a one-star review. We're going to move on. But uh, I, I mentioned that in a couple of uh, writing groups on Facebook, and they all rallied, and they all went in there, and they all put in reviews. Aww. It was awesome. So it was, it was nice to have the community come back behind me. So, That's you know. awesome. But, you know, it, um, on the flip side is you can turn those negative reviews into something positive. Yes. And, and we like have you guys did there with yeah, the we've, uh, hate mail, yeah. Yeah, and we've definitely found that. I mean, the biggest thing we get dinged for is writing too many sex scenes. And that's like encouragement to the right readers. Um, oh, for sure. We read LGBT stuff. Um, so I've never been upset about that, um, partly because at the beginning of our book, we have a reader advisement at the beginning of each book that says what um, sensitive topics are in it. Um, so book four has a warning about um, uh, some of the really negative stuff that happens in the book. Um, book five, each one has something, but most of them just start with uh, there will be uh, romance between people whose genders might not fit your expectations. If that offends you, consider yourself warned. Mm -hmm. So if they leave a negative review after we warned them on page one, their problem. We've gotten a couple of, this isn't what I read. I don't like reading about queer characters. I don't understand trans people. I'm just like, why do you even bother reading the book? Yeah. Those yeah. Are yeah. Anything, but that's a shame. You know, you can't do nothing about those people anyway. So, oh, you know, yeah. but 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 you're saying if they give you a negative review, if uh, someone who likes reading what you guys write, they see that review, and go, well, that's exactly what I like. Yeah. So that that's going to turn that negative review right on its head, and there's you know it's going to be a like a five star review. It's going to jump right out at them. And say yes, I want that. Exactly, and so that has worked out. But mainly, mainly reviews are just. Um, I don't want to say they're not, they're immaterial, um, but if you base your feeling about yourself as a writer on what other people say, you're, and that's the only thing you take into account, mm -hmm. you're going to hate your life. Oh, you're going to quit. You're, you will quit for sure. Yeah. So you can't do that to yourself. No, no, no. I don't want to say it's not important because if 90 people have told you you've done one thing wrong, you should probably look at that mm -hmm. one thing. But what I've learned is that everybody has an opinion. What? Uh, no way. Yeah. The old <laughs> joke, there's an old joke about this. I'm, I, I don't want to curse on, on camera, but there's an old joke about this and we all know it. <laughs> um, so when... The, well, you piqued my, my curiosity now. Oh, uh, <laughs> the polite version is opinions are like bums. Everyone has one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what I've noticed is often the rev a positive review right above a negative review will contradict the one below it. Mm -hmm. So two different people saw two completely different things. Definitely. Yeah. Well, you know, um, just a little bit of a change of subject. I did notice on your website that there is a page about donations. Um, we were just just on uh, the weekend, we were actually talking about a charity as well. So can you tell us a little bit about the donation work that you do, the charity work? Sure. Do you want to run a DS or do you want me to? This is mostly your ballpark. I just said, yes, let us do the thing. Yeah. Um, so because we're writing about um, characters who are dealing with real world problems, we try to donate to causes that help folks who are in similar boats. So um, all of our short story proceeds go to the Transgender Law Center. 
And then once a year, excepting the year that never was, um, we help out with Colorado Gives Day and we choose a local group to donate all of our funds from um, Cyber Monday to December 10th, which is Colorado Gives Day. And we've chosen the center before. Um, which is the local GLBTQ support center. Yeah. And we've done a couple of other, um, usually LGBT support groups. Um, one year we did a bigger thing for the Transgender Law Center, but we were trying to get better about supporting local. Um, and I will admit freely, I wasn't proud of it, but 2020, I just took a year off because 2020. <laughs> 2020, like you said, it didn't exist. So yeah. We're just, we just skipped right over it. Yeah. So I wasn't proud of it, but I looked around and just said, I don't think anybody has extra cash or extra energy. We all just need to take a break. I think yeah. anyone can understand that. Yeah. yeah. So at the end of the year or at the end of the tax season, we count up all of our sales and uh, we send out a couple of checks and then we do the same thing again for Colorado Gives Day. Um, so thank you for reminding us because we need to get on who we're going to donate to this year. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love hearing that kind of stuff. And I love when authors do that. That's very commendable for sure. Yeah. It's one of those things where we want to support our communities mm -hmm. and can do that through our writing to an extent. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it doesn't feel like enough. And so taking the proceeds from some of the books and the short stories and taking those from a story that's supporting the community to begin with and putting that back into other support systems. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's really meaningful for us as authors and hopefully it can do some good in the community. Yeah. I think this year um, we're still talking about this, but I think what I'd like to do is support one of the um, Native American youth groups um, because we have a couple of characters who are indigenous in our stories. And like one of our, favorite side characters is an indigenous coder named Deniki. And um, his name means moose because he got the nickname because whenever something bothers him, he steps on it. <laughs> and basically as a coder, he just squashes anything that pisses him off. <laughs> um, so because we're writing indigenous characters, it would be nice, nice to give back to that part of the community. Very cool. Yes, and Wanda agrees with you. That is awesome, guys. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. Love it. Oh, oh. I mean, I was. Richard, I, I think you're muted. Oh, I I was in a um, um, indigenous uh, summer camp when I was a kid with my cousins. I know what I look like. <laughs> Trust me, um, but I'm I'm from a mixed race family, and um, that program was huge for me as a kid. So I'd like to be able to donate to a similar program out here. Oh, that's, that's awesome. Sorry, I was muted there and I'm sitting there talking away and thanks. For <laughs> no worries. Right so, so along that same vein, so when you guys are writing your stories, especially the collaboration that you guys are doing together, what, so what influence do you to hope that your work's gonna have on your readers? Like, you know, like do you think it's inspiring them? Is it helping them? What, what are you trying to say to your readers? I like to think that we're inspiring and providing hope and providing a sense that you're not alone and that we can get through this if we stick together and rely on the communities that we can build. Um, I know like at one point, I think we'd only just released book two and we were at a convention and we had a young genderqueer person come up to us and it, like practically in tears because they were so excited to see the representation on the page. And that is so humbling and so exciting. I would love to see, love to know that our readers are taking something like that away from our books. And it's not just the fun story, it has that deep personal, interaction in that deep personal meaning as well. Yeah, and um, we had another um, 
communication from a reader's mom who reached out to say, thank you, because my transgender son is hugely excited that he can get an awesome job one day, like your characters. And I will admit my first reaction was, how old is your son? Because there's a lot of sex scenes in here. But my second reaction was, oh, yes, this is what we write for. Um, and yeah, to, we hope to light that fire of hope in our readers, make them feel like if they haven't found their community yet, it's out there. They're not alone. They just have to keep looking for their community and they will find it. And also, I suppose, let me articulate it this way. You don't have to just accept what happens in your life. You have choices. You can make changes. Even when things don't seem easy, even if they're not easy, quite frankly, things can get better. Even on the darkest night, you can light a candle. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm, that's awesome, yeah, for sure. Mm. Absolutely. So I believe, Olivia, you mentioned that you are a horticulturalist. Yeah. Um, does that uh, play a part in your, in your world building? I assume it must. It definitely does. Um, one of the things I've done is um, the climate has, so our books are set in 2155 on through those years. And um, the climate has changed quite dramatically. So Colorado is a lot more like Arizona. Um, so I've brought up plants that I hate from down south, like cholla, which is a type of cactus that has heat seeking um, enzymes in its barbs. So it will literally shoot its barbs out to embed in you as you're going by because its seeds are in its barbs. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's, some people call it teddy bear cactus because it wants to hug you. Why? Yeah, it's um, it's a cruel joke. Um, we've we've we played with a lot of plants that are vicious, um, but we've also played with the fact that so many people think that gene modification is just a negative. We've been playing with the positive side of what would it look like to gene modify crops so that they could survive these conditions. What would it look like to gene modify crops so that they're providing enzymes your body needs to process salts better so that when you sweat, you're not dehydrating completely. Um, various experiments like that. One of the subtle themes in our work is that technology is amoral. A drone can plant seeds or it can drop bombs. A technology for gene modification can make a plant sterile outside of someone's corporate control, or it can make the plant flourish in conditions that should have killed it. And the same goes for genetic modification in people. It can ruin your life or it can save it. How are you using it? That's the question. Um, so under my own name, I write um, illustrated books of nonfiction on the intersection between humans and, and plants, ethnobotany it's called. And I really enjoy working some of that experience in, but also the, sh the embodied experience of you reach in to do something and suddenly you pull your hand back because you've just put your hand on kosha, which is tumbleweeds and they're sharp. And so I love enlivening our scenes that can come off a little Mad Max if you're not really paying attention to your details with our character, you know, going from, I'm talking about the business, the work, the, ow, crap, I hate those things. <laughs> and things scenes like that come to life when you add the plant life in. Yeah, she got to geek out a lot about plants. <laughs> yes. And one of our characters um, in book five, who was introduced as an agricultural specialist. Um, and I had a lot of fun writing him saying all the details of why we're doing things. And his friend just being like, uh-huh. Sure. What? <laughs> Which is basically the two of us when you go on having <laughs> botany rants. Yeah. That's awesome. Writing what you know is certainly a... Uh... Yeah, anyone that knows anything about plants is going to read that and go, oh, yeah, there's no really knows what she's talking about. Mm -hmm. Sure. And the other people will have 
someone to sympathize with. <laughs> yeah, well, you'll be you'll be educating them because. And speaking of educating, I need you to educate me on this term here. It, you you speak a lot about themes around found family, and for people like me that I, I don't think I've ever heard that. Uh, I must live a shelter life, I guess, but I've never heard that term before. What exactly is found family? Like to me, I'm thinking, oh, there's my brother I haven't seen in a long while, but I'm sure it means more than that. But found family is basically the family that you choose. It's close friends that become like siblings. It's a, a really tight-knit community that feels like family and can, for some people who are displaced from their families or like a lot of LGBTQ teens, homeless, kicked out from their family, a found family can be a place and a group of people that replaces that sort of, that sense of family, that sense of a tight knit community, that support network. Um, it's a really common term in marginalized communities because a lot of us have to, if we want family, um, just because of the way our society is. And it's getting better, but it's, it's still really, really rough for a lot of folks. And so yeah, the, the found family is basically, you're not blood related, but you act and feel as close as family. Yeah, um, for good examples from um, from the good old days, I would say Mash for 077 is a found family. Um, and those kinds of situations where you might all be misfits, but you take care of each other and that's what matters. And when the chips are down, it doesn't matter whose DNA is involved. It's who takes care of who. No, it's, it's a very good point. I, you know, I think sometimes as a society, we get too caught up on the blood relations. And I, th I think it's the people that love and care about you that are your family. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's your sister or someone down the street or somebody you just met from a different country that comes in and befriends you and, you know, exactly. and they're very genuine with you and they're yep. family for sure. Yeah. And it's something that, we have unfortunately lost in a lot of parts of America and we really mm -hmm. need to rebuild is this idea that when the chips are down, what gets you through the dark times is your neighbor coming and knocking on the door and saying, Hey, you're doing okay. Mm -hmm. Or you're doing the same for them. Um, we've gotten into, I'm going to go on a little rant here. I'll make it short, but we've okay. gotten into a, a very atomized approach as a society where each of us is out, out for ourselves trying to do, best for just us radical and, individualism yeah and we've forgotten how to be communities and or we've been told to forget and we hear a lot survival of the fittest when people are trying to say i have the right to be cruel to someone else or take what i can the thing is what darwin actually said was fitness for survival of the type which meant he meant of the species um, what makes humans fit to survive is cooperation, is communication, is working in small groups. By ourselves out in nature, we're toast. Mm -hmm. We are not going to make it. What makes mm -hmm. us fittest to survive is our ability to cooperate with one another and build relationships and take care of each other. Yeah. yeah, that makes absolute sense. It's a great point. And uh, yeah, it, it's great that you quoted the actual quote mm -hmm. there. That was great to hear. Yeah. And so many people have forgotten it. And they just say survival of the fittest as a as a cover on I'm going to be a jerk. And it bugs the crap out of me because it's like your behavior works for a shark <laughs> for humans. That doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Liz has multiple plant books, but yes, we can post a link to her website. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I guess you can do. You guys can do that through the Facebook uh, feed. I guess uh, I don't know if you can do it right now. If not, you can just read it to us, and we can plug it in for you. Sure. Um, we can comment later too. Yeah. Yeah, we'll give you that link. I can um, get the Amazon link if you don't mind, um, just for a start, so that nobody. Sure. Cares. If That's you just okay. type in Olivia Wiley W Y L I E. Mm -hmm. um, it'll pop up on Amazon. The other place to go is, um, uh, let me type it in real quick, etsy.com slash leafing out art. And that's me. And all my books are up on there. 
And okay. right now, the newest book is um, a history of invasive weeds in America. Um, and this was my writing about quit yelling at the weeds. Your ancestors brought that plant. <laughs> um, <laughs> I hate it when people blame the plant. It's like your ancestors planted it because they thought it was pretty. It's not the plant's fault. <laughs> it's just it's innocent. Just wrong. Uh, or somebody, some recent ancestor planted it is a better way to say it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It was okay. everyone's, uh, you know, someone's weed is someone else's flower, so. Yeah, well, um, here we have a plant called um, Weedy Campanula, which is known as the Cap Hill Weed, um, because the Capitol Hill neighborhood in Colorado, or excuse me, in Denver, calls it the Cap Hill Weed. It was planted around all of our big redstone um, mansions in the 1920s because they thought it was gorgeous. Well, it is. It's also severely invasive, and now it's in all of the Denver metro. But I've had fun imagining what those redstone mansions are going to look like in another hundred years. <laughs> are they going to be really kept up, or are they going to fall into disrepair? And it's been fun reimagining parts of our, our town, although we've also taken out certain amounts of frustration on certain parts of town. Um, there's a there's a dog food company and when it's running it stinks up the entire commerce city neighborhood so um something terrible happens in this place something unforgivable and people burn the factory to the ground <laughs> i had so much fun writing that scene it was my little bit of schadenfreude <laughs> so on the january saying it uh a friend of hers had a cactus explode that had tarantulas growing inside it. She'll never oh, have a cactus. So yeah, that would have been quite the surprise. <laughs> yes, <laughs> what, what and that does happen. Cactus. Yeah, the tarantulas love to nest inside specific types of cacti because it is, I mean, nothing's going to touch your eggs when it's in a cactus. Yeah, no doubt. But on the other hand, what a nightmare. I had a, I had a cousin who... Um, opened up a box of bananas and there were tarantulas in it. Mm -hmm. I've heard that before. Yeah. I'm I was bit by a black widow as a child. Mm -hmm. So I do not react well to spiders. Mm -hmm. So I can only imagine what the reaction must have been. And it would if it had been me, it would have been catatonia. <laughs> I would have just <laughs> and I'm done. <laughs> It's a good time to die. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Not a, it's just talking about plants, uh, I remember when I first met my wife, I for her second date, I wanted to bring her her national flower. She's from Scotland. So I went online and researched and realized that it was a thistle. Uh-huh. Oh, maybe I better not do that. So I just went and bought her a rose instead. So <laughs> almost a sorny, almost. Yeah, um, yeah. You should you should research why it's the thistle, because it's a great horror. Well, I know why it's a thistle, yeah. It, it, yeah. It just, it's supposed to save them from attack for sure. Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I love working plants in. In fact, book four is a search for an undisturbed seed vault um, because Colorado is the backup for Svalbard, which is the seed arc that's way up north. Not a lot of people know this, but um, CSU takes care of the backup seeds that if Svalbard ever went down, um, CSU would take up the back, take up the slack, and become the new seed arc. And what is what is CSU? Colorado State University. Excuse oh. me, I forget that. <laughs> um, yeah, Colorado State University is a wonderful institution. I got my undergrad from them, and I helped out at the seed bank, and it was one of the most exciting things to realize that we were taking care of the future, basically. So weaving that into our writing, it also let me do a little bit of, of uh, daydreaming and um, reminiscing because we have one character who, among other things, is a history buff. So he's looking through these old pictures of Colorado State University and just being like, oh, it was beautiful. I wish I could have seen it in real life. <laughs> Yeah, it's helpful to have a history buff on the team because it lets us make history jokes and geeky jokes. And then all of his friends look at him and go, no. 
<laughs> That's great. Well, you know, the series is called Aces High Jokers Wild. And of course, um, the books all have the same theme of cards like aces and eights, draw dead, raise the stakes, call the bluff, um, things like that. So what is, why do you have that theme of cards? Uh, partially because survival is kind of a game of luck at this point. And also because the group of rebels that the series follows is one of those kind of crack teams that doesn't really follow the rules but gets stuff done and their code name is the wild cards uh so the the card theme and the titles and the series and uh in the cover art kind of ties into that um as well each character has their own code name from a card when they're welcomed officially into the unit, they pull a card and that becomes their code name. That's really cool. I was wondering about that. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Well, and I, I based that idea off of, uh, my mom is in the army. And so you hear some names of different units and they're all really clever. And in, in book three, we name some other crack bases. Uh, things like the Riptides, the Tearaways, and everybody really is, when you're in a unit, it does become sort of your family and your identity. So we went with the wild cards um, for our main unit, for our band of rebels and troublemakers. And misfits. And, yeah, it fits. And it's, it's made for some, it's made for great branding, but it's also made for some great jokes in the, in the story. Um, uh, Kevin, one of the protagonists, is the King of Hearts. But his friends keep hacking into his personnel file and turning it into Queen of Hearts. And he, you know, he gets back into his file, rewrites it, they do it again. So it makes for a nice running joke. So that's awesome. I see your series is that's the one that's centered on a trans man and openly he openly discusses his experiences. But what brought you to make the ch that as a choice of the author? Um, I mean, partially it was working through my own gender identity, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And partially when I was looking for stories around trans characters in general, I found a lot more stories about trans women than trans men. And so I really wanted to bring the trans masculine uh, experience to the page uh, because A, I couldn't really find it. There's more out there now, thank goodness. Um, but when we started writing, I couldn't really find it. And that was kind of what I was experiencing. Um, and B, it was really important to me to write a character that wasn't going through or wasn't transitioned, hadn't fully transitioned. Um, because again, a lot of the representation I saw was characters who had fully transitioned and it was a, a throwaway mention or a, um, a, a flashback or something that told us that they were trans versus this character actually dealing with gender identity and gender dysphoria and learning to be comfortable with himself throughout an adventure. Yeah. I, I didn't want it to be a purely, oh, I'm trans and I'm so angsty and it's awful. <laughs> because, I mean, a lot of the queer stories, again, it's getting better, but a lot of the queer stories at the time were very much coming out and learning about your own identity and realizing your own identity. And so I wanted to, to take away, step away from that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the way ES um, kind of directed us to do that is that as Aiden gets acceptance in other parts of his life, okay, I am a good commander. Okay, I'm not a sarcastic guy when it comes to dating. I can do this. As he gains confidence in other parts of his life, mm -hmm. he also gains more um, confidence in himself and his identity. Um, because he starts book one terrified of everything. And he anxious. <laughs> yes. And um, 
by the end of we're writing book six right now. And he is a commander and he is completely confident. And he just goes into the situation and goes, oh crap, what did you guys do? Okay, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this, we're gonna do this. We got this. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, is, is of course great to see and that uh, character arc is extra important, you know, with the topics that you're dealing with. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, in this futuristic world, um, would you say anything has changed in terms of, you know, diverse characters or things harder on them, easier on them, the same? I think we went a little bit harder on harder. diverse characters. Mm -hmm. uh, because in, in the imagined world, um, there are a lot of morality laws through the uh, companies that are in charge, corporations that are running um, America. So like some of them say you have to be in a straight relationship. So if you're queer. Rah. Yeah. Um, so we based the concept of the seven corporations that run all of America on the companies of the Gilded Age. So Rockefeller's company, Pullman's company, all of those, they used to put in place all sorts of morality rules. So each of these seven corporations has seven different sets of rules for their people. So the technology company, they couldn't care if you had three heads as long as you show up to work on time and do your job. The agricultural company will actually execute you for morality violations and they count LGBT relationships as a morality violation and non-conforming genders. So you get essentially seven subcultures and people who realize they're in the wrong place try to switch corporations, but the companies make that extremely difficult. The rules make that extremely difficult. So you've got a real gamut of experiences and then out beyond corporate control it's a hodgepodge it's essentially who are you with and where did they grow up and what experiences did they have um you get great places like the wild cards where they support each other and then you get crap places like aiden's home base where there was a lot of frankly viciousness it, it kind of goes back to that idea of writing to the darkest extreme we could imagine and then finding a way back, creating that hope, showing that found family can be a thing, that you can still build that support community, that nothing's actually wrong with you. Yeah, you're just in the wrong place. Yeah. It was also our, well, okay, I will admit my, because I'm a history buff. Okay, yes. history geek. Um, it was my, cynical take on what does it look like when a company owner isn't held to account by any rules. Um, because we've seen that in the Gilded Age here in America and we've seen it in other parts of the world. Uh, the Dutch East India Company comes to mind. Some very nasty history happens when a company gets to decide what is moral and what is legal based on a board of directors or a founder rather than Profit. yeah rather than a a government with people's best interests in mind we're not political what are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um these corporations each founder set down what he thought was the best way to live mm -hmm. and so you get seven different sets and we had a lot of fun playing with all of our darkest nightmares in okay. seven different directions. Fun, she says. Wow. Yeah. Well, my, my personal nightmare is Kavanaugh, the medical company. They are extremely eugenicist. Um, they want, their line is that they're going to perfect humanity. And I was raised with a lot of concepts of what does it mean to uh, be a decent person, and by that, be a middle class or upper middle class, succeeding, achieving person. And um, 
I took a lot of that internalized elitism and worked it into this. And it was cathartic for me, but it was also very dark because what does our culture do to us? It makes us feel like no matter what we do, we're still gonna fail. We're still gonna be worthless. And so we write those situations and then we fight them and we counter them. Yeah, for sure. That sounds interesting. So yeah. I, I just see that we're, we're getting it near the end of the show here. So I just, uh, before we go, uh, you both have individual books that you're writing as well. So it, when can uh, we expect to see those? And then uh, what about your collaboration? I think you said you've got uh, your next books coming out uh, next year, early next year. Mm -hmm. Uh, book six of the wild cards is going to be called Deuces Are Wild, and that's going to come out in February of next year. There's an audiobook for book four coming out either this fall or next spring, depending on how schedules go. Um, but it'll be at latest next January. Um, other than that, I don't have. Well, I have just released. Yeah, I just released a book on the invasive plants of North America and their histories and how they arrived in the United States. And I have a whole series of books on the intersection between folklore, humanity, and the plant world. Um, they're all up on my Etsy store or they're all up on Amazon, just type in my name and you'll find all of that. Um, we've got currently the first three um, of the Wild Cards books, the Aces High Jokers Wild books, up on audiobook. Kurt Graves reads for us, and he is a genius, and he brings our characters to life. And every time I listen to check the information or check the book, I ES can always tell because I just won't stop grinning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then my my first book should be out sometime late this year. Uh, it's called Heart Trick. It's a queer fantasy romance. Uh, you just need to finish the rewrites. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if anybody happens to be in Colorado, we will be at, if it happens, please let it happen, um, WhimsyCon, which is in September. And we'll be doing a book signing at um, uh, the Boulder Bookstore on October 26th. So... Oh. Yeah, if you want to come and get a book signed, we'd love to see you there. That's awesome. And ES, uh, you you have your books also on that Etsy store. Do you have them anywhere else? Um, my books are not on Olivia's Etsy store. Uh, you can find them on argentumbooks.com. Okay, good. Um, well, I mean, you can when it comes out. You can find my short right. stories there now. They also have a really cool Patreon that has lots of fun stuff on it. I have done nothing on my Patreon in like a year. So don't sign up for that. <laughs> sign up for my newsletter instead. That's awesome. Thank you too for uh, joining us today. And uh, we wish you the best of luck going forward. And you know, maybe we'll get you back on again sometime uh, next year. And we can talk about what's new in your, your lives and your individual books and in your collaboration. That sounds awesome. It's, they sound very exciting. I'll have to look into it. And just uh, Christy, uh, Speaking about Patreons, I know Christy has one. And uh, what else is new in Christy Stratos stratosphere? <laughs> well, um, I have my Kindle Vela historical fantasy book that is called Grimoire Society of Dark Acts. It's historical fantasy and takes place in the Victorian era. So if that sounds good to you, you can certainly read it on Kindle Vela. The first three episodes are free. And after that, it takes tokens which you you get your first 200 for free and after that you have to pay for them and if you don't want to mess with kindle vela um you can head over to my patreon which is patreon.com slash christy stratus and you will get all of them with your membership and you can join for a dollar a month and get access to that so it's been a really really fun series um well book serial to write um i'm so enjoying it and i'm publishing episodes at least once a week if not more sometimes more often um so definitely check that out i hope you guys will enjoy it and let me know what you think about it uh what about you richard what's up with you now uh not a lot. I'm still uh, narrating. I'm doing my edits for my narration of uh, the book that just released in June, Keeper of the Jewel. And I was so rushed today. I'm normally not in a rush. And I apologize to our two guests that uh, I'm normally here long before anyone else gets here. And I just happen in the background when you guys show up. 
I just started uh, selling my books at the market. I haven't been I haven't been to any kind of book event since March 2020, and I've just been going stir crazy. So I, an opportunity happened that uh, in our, we have this big farmers market where people take bus tours to go to, and our COVID uh, restrictions in Ontario have been awful, and they've finally just started loosening them up, and they're allowing us to go in there and and sell our stuff. So I figured you know, I'm going to set up. So actually, my booth is set up. I don't have to do it anymore. I just go in and sell my books. So three days a week, I have my computer with me. I sit there and write. And if someone comes by and they wants to buy a book, you know, they're normally there for farm fresh produce, but sometimes you get a fantasy reader in there and they buy my book. So anyway, that's why I was rushed today. So that's what I'm doing. I'm selling my books at a market three days a week. And yeah, other than that, uh, I'm about 84,000 words into Dragon Sect, which is book two of the High Cliff Guardian series. And I will be doing a live read probably on Thursday again this week. I, For our guests, I, I live read everything I wrote this week. Uh, Thursday or Friday, I'll live read it just as a way to edit it. So that's also fun. And I, I invite other authors to join me in my live reads and we can read from your books as well. So if anyone is interested in doing that, just let me know. Uh, they can message me and we'll do that. We'll get you on and we'll read from your books. So uh, that's it for, uh, for me. And uh, next week, our guest is nobody. Christy and I are both off next week, and uh, we're going to return August 10th. And when we return August 10th, we're going to have two more authors, which is kind of neat having more than one on at a time. We're going to have uh, E. Sands and Justin Bernison. They're a team of science fiction and fantasy authors, and my tablet's in the way of my screen here. It should be interesting to talk to them about their collaboration. So until then, until we meet again, Chris and I wish you all to have an amazing week. Take care.